Good morning, everybody. My name is John Aldrich, and uh, I serve as a trustee on the board. Uh, today I'll be reading from Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of, to God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That is by testing, you may, not, you may discern what is the will of the God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John. I'm so very thankful for, uh, for James that came and, and rounded off Romans chapter 11 last week. What a treat that was. I got to listen about an hour after you guys did. And, and, and that was over a, a coffee conversation where he said, hey, is there anything you want me to deal with? And I said, well, I mean, I'm going to be in Romans 11 and I was going to try to tackle that whole chapter. Now, if, if you're feeling squirrely and you want to jump in there and do that, then go ahead. I honestly never expected. I figured he'd look at that and go, nah, I'm leaving that for him. But he didn't. He jumped in and he carried us all the way through the end of that very difficult section dealing with the people of Israel. And I'm so very thankful for that. And I know that you enjoyed uh, his sharing with us here. What we come to today is the major transition in the letter the major shift in the argument of Romans. Because in the first 11 chapters, what Paul has done, and, and it's typical of what he does in his letters. You'll find this to be true almost every time you read one of the letters of Paul. Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. You're going to find a normal pattern. Here's what Paul does. He starts his letter in the normal Greco-Roman style with a greeting, very similar to the way we would, would when we would write, Dear so-and-so. The Roman letters would have just taken a little bit more robust information. And then he moves into the body of his letter in which most of the time he's going to, <coughs> excuse me, he's going to begin laying down some indicative truths. These are just simply things that are. He'll begin teaching this and this and this. And occasionally, there will be a little bit of a do this in the middle of the instructions, but primarily, he will focus just on the instruction. Then he'll come to a place where he'll use a word usually that we are translating normally into Therefore, and therefore will begin the shift into what are we now to do in response to everything that we have heard. And that's what we're going to begin doing today. We're going to begin shifting from the instructional, from the theological, from the doctrinal, and we're going to go into the response. We're going to go into the application Paul's be going, going to begin to, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, begin to tell us what our duty is. And I know the middle schoolers in the room are saying, he just said duty. It's okay. It's what our responsibility is. It's what our commitment should be. And so we're shifting today. On the basis of everything we've heard before, now Paul is going to give us the call to action. I wrote this little sentence down. The righteousness of God that we have learned about received only by faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ apart from the works of the law both by Jew and Gentile alike will by the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit, lead the justified ones into lives of surrendered obedience. What we're going to begin talking about today and through the end of this letter 
is what does it look like to live the new life of the Spirit? Having received the righteousness of God that we could never earn, that we could never work for. Having received it only by faith and only in the person and work of Jesus. Having God the Holy Spirit within us to do and to work and to will. How are we to respond and live this out? That's where we're headed starting today. It's exactly the same thing a lot of times. People will read the the works of Paul, and then they'll read the little letter of James, and they'll begin saying, wait a minute, Paul and James, they don't agree. Paul says everything is by faith. And then James over here says that if you don't have works, then you don't have faith. Here's where Paul and James jump on the same train and ride together. Because what they're both saying is that genuine faith in Jesus will produce works in our life. It will produce a newness. And he's going to begin defining what this newness looks like today. As we begin to look at the the chapters moving forward, he's going to have a progression of how followers of Jesus, how those who have been justified by faith are to live in connection with God. What is our response to God as the justified ones? And then what is our response next to one another? Because we're all in this together by God's design. His people are fit and formed together as the body of Christ in his absence, representing him in the world. How are we to live this out with one another? And then finally, he's going to talk about how we are to live this new life out in front of those who are on the outside, those who are in the world, those who are not yet followers of Jesus, but may one day become followers of Jesus by faith as well. First, two verses that provide the anchor for everything else we're going to to build on top of it through God's Word. And it is how we, as those who have been justified by faith, are to respond to God. Now, let me ask you that question that I ask you fairly often, and it is this. Are you today, are you someone, and I want you to answer if you are, are you someone that would say, I am a follower of Jesus. I have placed my faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. I believed in my heart. I've confessed with my mouth. I am following Christ by faith and faith alone. Are you a follower of Jesus today? Yes. Awesome. That's who Paul is talking about. Now, if you're not, If you were to say, you know what, Pastor Kay, I just said yes, and I don't even know what you mean, but I didn't want to be the only one sitting here and not say yes. Listen, can I I just give you the the overarching 30,000-foot view? Here's the gospel. You are broken by sin, and you know it. There's no doubt in your mind that you are. You'll try to talk yourself out. You'll try to convince yourself that you're not as bad as others But deep down, you know you're as bad off as can be. And given the right circumstance, you would be just as bad as anybody else. Listen, God knows about your sin. And and you're a sinner because of, of the first that disobeyed God. It's been passed down. It's been passed down to every one of us. And we're we're sinners. In need of forgiveness. We're sinners in need of salvation. And no matter how hard we try, we can't change what we are. But God in His grace, God in His mercy has provided a way where we can be righteous in His sight. It's never by works. It's through the work of Jesus. God the Son who put on flesh. We celebrate at Christmas. We celebrate his coming where God the Son put on flesh so that he might live perfectly, righteously, so that he might fulfill the law that we could never accomplish. And then Jesus, in his perfection, laid down his life and allowed all of the wrath of God that's aimed at all of the sinners of the world. Jesus took that on himself, on the cross, and he bore that wrath for you and me. 
and then put in the ground as a dead man, wondering what was God going to do with this sacrifice that's been made. On the third day, they came to the tomb and discovered that he wasn't there because he got up from the grave proving that God had received that sacrifice. It was sufficient, and he has been victorious over everything that has corrupted us. And here's what God says. I've got a righteousness that is not your own, but if you'll receive it, if you'll deny all others and receive Jesus, if you'll confess him as Lord, if you'll believe in your heart that I raised him from the dead, if you'll lay your yes down with Jesus, you will be saved. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, all you have to do is say yes. That's what I want. If you're a follower of Jesus today, Paul says, okay, I've taught you all I'm going to teach you on this subject right now. Now, it's about responding. What are we going to do? First, our response to God in these first steps of new life. I've written down the total surrender of one's life is the first and proper response of every grateful believer saved by faith in Jesus. Can we agree that there's one thing going on in our world that frustrates us all and something that we're all guilty of at some point in our life? And that's called entitlement. Don't you hate it when you see that? It, it, it's like, I can't stand it when folks think they deserve something that we all know they don't deserve. And then we turn around and do the very same thing. Because in our, in our circles, we feel like we're owed something. It's that catch-22. It's like when somebody says, you know, there's two kinds of people I hate. It's the folks that go really slow in front of me and the folks that ride my bumper behind me. And you're just like, uh, w- wait. Well, okay, so <laughs> entitlement. We all know it. We see it. It disgusts us unless we're the entitled ones. If you're a parent, <laughs> you know how you feel when you ask a child to do something and they go, what? But I got other things I've got to do. And you're like, I have supported your very life. You're alive today because of mine and your mama's efforts. And you're not going to. So we go, same kind of thing. We call total surrender when the majority of Christians, be honest, the majority of Christians live a life by faith they have received salvation. But by practice, they want to say, And I want to thank you, God, and I'll be sure to call you when I need you because I know I'm going to. But until then, I got this. God's like, yeah, that's uh, not what it's about. It's about total surrender. Let's look at these two verses. We're going to see the what and the how. What's the what? The what is the grateful and complete surrender of our lives and bodies. The how is through the intentional and consistent renewal of our mind. Here's what he says. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters. This word appeal, it's not a command, but it is a strong urging. Not like a salesman going, check it out. It's going to be great. Going to look good. Come on, let's do this. And it's not also, uh, it's not a slave driver that's demanding. But what it is, is like a good coach. It's like a general of, of troops before they go into a battle. And they're, they're giving the, the words that we're going to charge out for. There is an expectation that everybody on the team is going to charge out and run through the little paper thing that the cheerleaders are holding. And we're going to go do what we've been designed for. The same with the soldiers. There's the expectation. One might say the obligation to respond 
to these words of the general that's telling you this is what we're going to do and we're going to go out there and we're going to perform in the way we've been designed to and then we all rush out. Of course, you probably don't rush out anymore. That's the old way of fighting. But at any rate, you get the idea. It's more of a, it's like one of those, I'm begging you to respond because this is the foundation that if you don't get this right, everything else we're going to try to build, how we work with one another, how we work with those on the outside, it's never going to be level if we don't get this straight from the get-go. So every follower of Jesus, listen up. This is how we respond to God as his justified ones. He said, I appeal to you on the basis or by the mercies of God. It's the basis. It's, it's what we're looking at. You say, what, what are we looking at? Romans 1 through 11. You know how many sermons that was? Anybody want to take a guess? Six? <laughs> 25. 25 sermons, Romans 1 through 11. Maybe you weren't here for all of them. I would recommend not trying to catch up all at one time. Pace yourselves. They're on YouTube. They're on Right Now Media under the Oasis Church tab. You can find them there and catch up. I encourage you to do that. Because one of the worst things that you can do is not have all of the instruction and try to be one who's grateful for all the things that you don't even know you have. So go back. Don't forget what's in Romans 1 through 11. It's the basis. It is the mercies of God that have been poured out for us. Remember, what is mercy? It's God not giving us what we deserve. What is it we deserve? We deserve His wrath in full. But in His grace... By His mercy, God the Son has taken that on Himself. We never have to receive one ounce of the wrath of God because God's already taken it for us. And that should generate in us a heart of absolute gratitude. My Lord, Thank you for what you have done for us. The mercies of God that we've seen in chapters 1 through 11. Redemption, justification, reconciliation, adoption, salvation. Those things that have been done for us. And then those things that continue on for us. Things like uh, grace and hope and the love of Christ that we'll never be separated from. Think about, if you're a follower of Jesus, think about all that God has lavished upon you. Think about all that He has poured out of His resources for you to have the redemption that is yours. Paul says, I urge you, I beg you, on the basis of everything that God has done for you to present your bodies. This idea of our body in the Hebrew thought wouldn't have just been the bones and the muscle and the skin. It would have been the whole life. But I think particularly, Paul is thinking in particular about our physical bodies. Because he's going to talk about the mind in a minute. But think about all that your body does throughout the week. No, I'm serious. Think about it. All that you do with your members... And then think back to Romans 6, if you were here. If you're not, you catch up. Where Paul says, listen, because you've been justified by faith, because you're in Christ, no longer present your members to sin, to be used as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather present yourselves to God as those that have been raised from the dead and your members to God as instruments for His use, for righteousness. Paul's going right back to that, and he's saying, as a, as a response, the first step in this new life as a follower of Jesus, justified by faith, is to bring your body and lay it on the altar of sacrifice. Total commitment to Him. Some might say, that's radical, is it? 
I mean, is that really, is that radical? To say that because of what I've been, because of what God has done for me, I'm going to turn over the keys of control of my life and I'm going to hand them to God. Is that really all that radical? Unusual, maybe. But is it really radical? I mean, think about it. Apart from what God has done for you and I, do we even have life of any, uh, 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 of, of any future? You say, well, I got, I got breath in my lungs. Yeah, but how long is that going to last? James says it's just a, a puff of water vapor that you see for a second and then it's gone. Apart from what God has done for you, do you have anything of lasting worth? No. What do you have? Your sin, your guilt, and a guilty verdict that's going to result in the wrath of God. That's what you've got apart from God. But now he's given you life. He's given you abundance. He's given you resources. He's given you the person of the Holy Spirit. He's given you grace and hope to continue through. You'll never experience condemnation. Is it really all that radical to say, Lord, I'm going to turn the keys over of my life to you. There you go. Use me as you will. Is that really all that radical? I don't think so. Because that's what God, through the Apostle Paul, is calling every one of us to do. But here's what God's not. He's not, he's not envisioning kicking and screaming. So when I was a teenager, unfortunately, I heard these verses through the lens of, well, you just want me to not have any fun. That's what you want. What you're saying, I hear you preacher man. You're just saying don't do anything fun and just live the, you just want us to live the boring life you live. Well, I'm not down for that. And God's saying, I'm not asking you to live boring at all. I'm trying to help you avoid things that are going to get you off track and are going to create the stench of death in your life. And it's just going to lead to frustration and aggravation and you sitting by the side of the road pouting because you don't know what's going on. I want to invite you to a life of freedom. I want to invite you to a life of abundance. But I'm going to have to drive the car in order to get you there. So he says, I want you to present your bodies, not as a sacrifice to be burnt up. You think about Leviticus chapter 1, it talks about the whole burnt offering that is to be burnt up in completion so that none of it can be uh, used again. Everything burnt up. There's no, no take backs on this burnt offering. That's what we're laying our lives up on the, jumping up on the altar, boom, laying down. Not to be sacrificed, but to live sacrificially. Well, now really, is that all too much to ask? Given that the one who loved us gave himself for us and went to the true sacrifice of death and then got up from the dead and said, so therefore, you have nothing to worry about. Just follow me. How great is that? Present your bodies as a sacrifice alive. Total, complete, absolute surrender. A living sacrifice. I wrote down the willing, grateful, and joyful surrender to our Abba Father. Isn't that what the Holy Spirit produces in us? No longer are we no longer are we standing against God as his enemy. We're not even standing in the company of folks that God has approved. It's better than that. Through the Holy Spirit that indwells us by faith in Jesus alone, we get to call God the Father Daddy. We get to run up into the arms of our loving Heavenly Father, who, by the way, knows everything about your past, knows everything that you struggle with, knows all of the things that you think make Him mad and want to quit on you. And He says to you, 
son, daughter, get up here. My son has already paid for all that. Now, I want to talk to you about it, but I don't want you to run from me because my love is never turned away. That's the kind of thing he's called us to. And if that's the sacrifice he wants us to live, well, let's huff up on that altar. Lay down. Let him do whatever it is he wants to do. Why? Because it's the best place we can ever be. But we got to hand the keys. We got to say, God, I'm all in. You all in on me? In response, I'm all in on you. When we do, he says that this sacrifice is holy and acceptable. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want you to embarrass yourself. How many of you in your heart think that you presenting your body, your life, you're saying, God, I just want to present to you my life as a living sacrifice. I, I would wonder how many in the room think that that offering is either holy or acceptable. You'd be like, um, yeah, it wouldn't take you 14 days with this set up to look and find a blemish. You'd find a whole bunch. You need to discard me and find one that's a little more acceptable. But we missed the point because we weren't here when we talked about the, the, the thing that Jesus has done for us. You've got to find that in Romans 1 through 11. You've got to hear the fact that we are in Christ by faith so that when God deals with us he's not dealing with the knucklehead that stands here in the lavender shirt he deals with God the son in whom now I am in and he goes oh yeah well then I can treat you with absolute love and acceptance because of what he's done for you and I stand in the presence of the God, in the presence of God my Abba Father holy pure set apart from God acceptable you want me yeah, I want you well you you sure you can do something with me I'm absolutely sure I can, and I will do something well, if you jump up here on this altar. We'll get started. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, pleasing, which is your spiritual worship. Now, this word that's translated spiritual in the ESV actually was originally in the, in the King James that if you grew up in church decades ago, you heard it all the time as not your spiritual worship, but your reasonable service. It's a tricky little word, but that idea of reasonable actually is a really good translation because it has the idea of logic. It has the idea of, does this make sense? Let's go back. Romans chapter 6, at the beginning of it, Paul makes a rhetorical question. He makes a, a question that he's wanting you to answer. Of course not. Here was the question. Shall we that have been, that are now dead to sin, should we continue on living in sin? And our response would be, well, absolutely not. Why would we go on sinning now that we're dead? Because that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to go back to the prison cell to spend the night that you've been released from, right? Now, I know Otis did it on Andy Griffith, but for the most part, we understand if you get out of jail, you don't go back. You take that address out of your Maps app, right? Because you don't want to go back to that place. Because that doesn't make any sense. But you know what does make sense? When you lay your life up on the altar of the one who loves you, the one who has given you life and promised you love and forgiveness and eternity with him, makes total sense to go, here are the keys, Lord, because I promise I'll put it in the ditch, but I know you won't. He says it's your spiritual worship. It's, it's how you worship God by submitting yourself fully and completely to him. He says, it makes sense. But most Christians want to hold on to a little part of their life and they want to try to 
walk with one hand in, the, in, in, in Christ and one hand in, in the flesh. Paul's saying it, it doesn't work that way. You're just going to hurt yourself, and it's going to hurt. But if you'll let go of those things that will only bring destruction and you'll be a living sacrifice, then your foundation before God will be level. And boy, we'll be able to build on that how we walk with one another and how we walk with those on the outside. Present your body. Here's my questions. Number one, believer, is this true of you today, right now, today? Does God have full and complete control of your life? Have you ever given God full and complete control? Now, I, I, know, I know what it says in one of the Corinthians. I can't remember which one. One of them, Paul says, uh, you know, you're bought with a price, right? So you're not your own. Your body's the temple of, of God. You, you, you knew you didn't belong to yourself because that blood of Jesus paid for you. He owns you. And that is the truth. But God is not going to force you to be used by him. He's not going to drive you to the water. Now, there is a such thing as discipline, and he's a good father, and he don't mind bringing out the belt every now and then, but, but he's not going to force you to surrender what he's given you to surrender. Think about the garden. He didn't make Adam and Eve do the right thing. He allowed them to choose knowing full well that they might choose wrongly. He does the same for us. Oh, he'll save us on the basis of faith. He'll let us wander. It, it will convict your heart until you've become calloused in your mind and grieve the Holy Spirit. But what he wants you to do is surrender because you want to. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said have you, ever, have, have you ever actually went, God, my life is yours, total and complete? Is it true of you today? It's our calling, and it's not so radical. He would say it's reasonable. You say, okay, okay, I want to do that today. Or, yes, I have done that. Turn my life over to God, and I've I've given him the keys to the car. But I tell you what, it's hard to stay on that wagon. It's, it's you know, I, I did that, but boy, it's, man, there are a lot of voices. Man, there are a lot of distractions. Boy, there are a lot of bumps in the road. And I tell you, it's hard to stay on that wagon of surrender. Well, Paul says, but I got the how to stay on. If you'll be willing to turn over the keys, then God has provided the how for you to keep them in his hands. And it's called the renewing of your minds. We pick up in verse number two. He says, first, don't be conformed to this world. Don't be conformed to this world. This idea of being conformed. It's, it's actually, he's actually not telling us He's not instructing us not to do something. It's in a, we don't have, we don't use this a lot in our, and if we use it at all in the English language, we, we either have a do or don't do or, you know, first person. Third. This verb, is, is, it's in a tense that's called the middle passive. It has this idea of don't allow yourself to be conformed by this world. Don't allow yourself, don't, don't put yourself in a position where you're going to be conformed. This, this idea of conformed, it's, it's being patterned after. It's being molded after the values of something. It's, it's looking like something else. When, when I was at camp, when I was an older teenager and I used to use this verse at camp, I would say, and, and back then we played with Play-Doh. I don't even, do they make Play-Doh? I don't know the teachers use. Okay. But when I was a kid, I had this Play-Doh set and it was Scooby-Doo. All right. So you take the Play-Doh and you roll it up, you press it in a little mold and it looks like, uh, it looks like Play-Doh. It looks like a little blob of Play-Doh till you press it in that mold and all of a sudden you open up and guess what you got? Scooby-Doo. You've been molded like Scooby-Doo. Okay. Here's what Paul's saying. Look. 
You live in a world, and, and, and it's got a mold. If you allow yourself to be pressed into that mold, you know what you're going to look like and sound like and operate like? The world. Scooby Doo. <laughs> okay, so you're going to look like Scooby the world. So he says, don't allow yourself to do that. You're like, oh, okay, well, tell me what the world did. What do you mean by that? Well, he's not actually talking about the cosmos. What he's using is a word that could be defined as the age or this present age. Now think about it again. Think about this bigger argument. When God made the world and God created all the things, what, what was the adjective that he used to describe what he had made? God saw it and said that it was good. What was it that messed up all of God's good world? It was a three-letter word, starts with an S, ends with an N. It's called sin. Sin has corrupted this present age. See, there was the age of creation when it was good, but then sin messed it up. And so now we're living in the sin-cursed age. And so Paul says, don't allow yourself, as a justified follower, don't allow yourself to continue to be conformed to the patterns, to the values of this world. Do you realize that we are constantly being bombarded by the values and the thinking of this world? Television. Um, the, the, the celebrities and their opinions, social media, the news outlets, everything that, books that we pick up and read, classes that we go to, and I got to have this class to get this degree, but you know what they're pounding you with? They're pounding you with the values and the thinking and the molding and the pattern of this present evil, wicked age. Paul says, you want to continue as a living sacrifice? You're going to have to say no to the world. You're going to have to say no to the thinking of the world. You're going to have to take a position of nonconformity. Man, back in the late 70s and 80s, that's called punk rock. Nonconformity. If the man says it, then I'm against it, and I'm going to play it in a style of music that no one can understand. That was nonconformity. And, and you look at that as society, and, and sometimes it's true to look at that and go, you know what, at the end of the day, though, that's just rebellion. And in many, maybe most cases, it was rebellion. You know what God's calling us to do? Rebel against the world. He's calling us to plant our flag in Jesus. Boom. And go, I ain't moving. I don't care what all of y'all think. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what it costs me. I'm up here on the altar living as a sacrifice right where I need to be. I'm with God and I ain't with y'all. And I don't care what you think about that. you got to say no to the world. And you know what that's going to be? One of the hardest things that you and I do. Because chances are great we already look like the world. Let me ask you this question. What of your life has already been conformed to the world? I found a little book in my house. I don't even know where it came from. In that little basket, I found a book called Radical Discipleship. This morning by John Stott, it just appeared in my house. I thought, hey, I bet, I wonder. And I picked it up and I thumbed through it and I discovered, hey, he's talking about some of what we're talking about today. He said, I got four of the biggest challenges that Christians and the church will face that we have to say no to. The first one, pluralism. All roads do not lead to God. God does not accept worship through any vein except Jesus crucified and risen. That is not intolerance. That is the truth. 
If I tell you that if you go west, that you will reach the Atlantic Ocean, I may be in my mind thinking, if you get all the way till the road runs out, you turn around and come back the other way, you'll get there. But that's not the right direction. You can't get to the Atlantic Ocean if you go west. You must go east to get there. It's not intolerance. It's the truth. Now, how we tell it to folks, I mean, we ain't got to take our Bible and go, oh, you're a Mormon? Great. Bam! Let me tell you about the love of Jesus. No, don't do that. Okay? Don't, he's not called us to do We share in love. But you know what we got to stand on? Truth. I am the way, Jesus says, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Pluralism, it's out there. It's trying to get you to bite because folks will like you if you espouse that philosophy. But it's wrong. What about materialism? Get all the stuff you can get. Hey, you worked hard for that. It, what? I thought everything belonged to God. I thought we were supposed to use everything that he has given us for his glory and not for my own good pleasure. Boy, materialism will suck us in. And next thing you know, we look like Scooby-Doo. Moral relativism. Oh, boy. Well, you know what? It's not for me. But who am I to judge? Well, you're not a judge. But, but you know what? You're also not allowed to do. You're not allowed to say, if God says no, you're not allowed to go, but if that's what you like, okay, look, we're not to take on the world. The world's going to do what the world has to do. But in this body right here, we better tell folks the truth. We better stand on that kind of stuff. But moral relativism, eh, maybe. For, man, that is a conformity. That's nipping at our heels. What about narcissism? You go, I know. Tell them narcissists that they need. Look, do you realize how many narcissists are in the room today? On the count of three, everybody raise your hand. One, two, three. <laughs> ah, ah, cowards. You know it's true. You know what narcissism is? It's, a, it's, it's an absolute like a fixation on yourself. And you know who's guilty of that? Every wife looks over and goes, you know, you know, okay? He's not going to turn to you because he loves you. But we all wrestle with that. Me, generation. Get, hey, you better affirm me because what I think is okay. I mean, okay, but that seeps into the church. And we got to be careful. Question, believer. In what ways are your thoughts and actions conformed already to this world? Because like, we're talking about this. I, I just feel like maybe God the Holy Spirit is already speaking to you going, you know what? The, you, you're already looking like the world here. Uh, that, that part of you is not up on the altar because you're, you're already thinking with the mind of the world. With well, that old way that you used to think makes total sense to you because we still live in the flesh. Where are we already thinking and being conformed to the world. If nothing else, where do you feel pressured by the world to conform? Just, just, just say it's just, look, just nod and it'll be all right. Where do you feel the pressure? That's where we're going to have to stand up. That's where we're going to have to trust God. That's where we're going to have to give him the keys and go, I'm going to follow you. I might lose my job. God says, that's okay. I gave you that job. I give you another one. Okay. I might suffer for this. That's okay. That's, I already told you that's the way to follow me through suffering. It's all good. Let's go that way. Okay. He says, don't be conformed to the world. Say no to the world, but be transformed. See, this is this word that we, we transliterate where we get this idea of metamorphosis. Move from one thing to another. Be transformed. Don't be conformed. Be changed. Let God change the way you think. Let God change the way you process. Let God change how you go about deciding what's true and what's not. And again, he's not asking you to get out there and dig a ditch that you don't know where a ditch is supposed to go to. He's saying, allow yourself to be transformed. Don't allow yourself. Don't put yourself in the position to be conformed to the image of the world. Rather, allow yourself to be carried along 
and renewed in your thinking. Like carried along. Who's going to carry me? I'm glad you asked that question. Who is it that has been implanted into every follower of Jesus? Two words. The first one starts with an H. The second one starts with an S. Who is it, class? Holy Spirit. You know who he is? Newsflash. He's God. Now let that sink in for just a half a lifetime. And you'll still not know what to do with it. The fact that God himself is dwelling within me. He says, don't look. Don't allow yourself to be conformed to the present evil world. Rather, allow yourself to be transformed. How am I going to do that, God? Oh, oh I got that. I, got, I can handle that. Won't be nothing to that. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn how to hear from me. You're like, how am I going to learn how to hear from you? Get familiar with my voice. Get, get familiar with the things that I've already said. And then those things that I've already said are going to become very applicable in times that you're like, how in the world did that even apply? But I know that I'm hearing from God because I'm putting myself, allowing myself to be transformed. Not just God's Spirit, not just God's Word, but God uses also His people. You see, it's necessary that we put ourselves in the place to hear from God's Spirit and to listen and obey. We put ourselves in a position to know God's voice and to understand what He's always said so that we can know what He always will say and then surround ourselves with God's people who are going through the same wrestling match we're going to so that we might point one another back to the Scripture, back to the Lord, and walk this thing out together. But if we're not together, you know what we can't be? Together. If we're not together, we can't be together. If I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit, I can't obey Him. If I don't know what He says, then I can't know what to do. So God says, look, just... Put yourself in a position to be changed. You don't have to change yourself. Just open yourself to me, your time. Open yourself to me, your ears. And open yourself to me in the lives of one another. And here's what you'll discover. Over time, he says, your mind will be renewed. And that by testing, you're going to discover... That when you start testing the world around you, you'll be able to discover what the will of God is. And it ain't that. So it's got to be that. Well, I don't know what to do, Pastor. I don't know what the will. Can you help me discover the will of God? You, you know who would be better apt to help you and I discover the will of God? You, you, you know, God. And you know what he says? I'll show you. I'll teach you how to discover that. If you'll... Open your ears to me, open your mind and heart to my word, and you'll surround yourself with my people. When you go through that process, you'll start learning how to go, yeah, looking at my brother. Yeah, well, you know what? God's word said, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay, no. Yeah, yeah, let's go. Next thing, I might be at the crossroad with someone else, and they're saying, go this way. You, know, ah, you wouldn't go that way because God's word says da, 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 and you know, you'll be going against God's leading in his spirit. So don't go that way, go this way. How did you learn that? Well, I learned it from my brother. Where did he learn it? He learned from God's Word. He talked to me, and I'm teaching it to you. See how it works. And the next thing you know, we're navigating life, and we're discovering the ways to go and the ways not to go. And it's all been about one thing. God, here's the keys. They're yours. How am I going to maintain that? By the renewal of your mind. Saying no to the world. Saying yes to Him. Let me ask you a question. What has God most recently changed your mind about? Like you used to think one way, and now you think differently. Yeah, I used to think that, but I don't think that no more. And I know that was wrong, and I shouldn't have thought that then. But you know what? I live and learn, and, and God's faithful. And I don't think, what was the last thing? Just give it a minute. How long has that been? What, what if that was something God wanted to do daily? 
Like, what if God wanted every day for you to get into his word and for him to be able to say, hey, you know, based on what that says right there, once you understand what he means, hey, you know, you used to think this about this. I don't want you to think that no more. Oh, okay, I won't think that no more. I used to admit it. And maybe you tell somebody, hey, you know, I used to think this, but I read this in God's Word this morning. This is what God taught me. I don't think that no more. You know why? Because that's what God said. And no matter what I thought, I want to do what he says. He's renewing your mind. He's changing the way you think. He's creating in you a vessel that can be used for God's glory until Christ returns. What would that look like if we were to just do that every day? What would we have to say no to today in order for that to be possible? I think probably we already know that, don't we? Here's the question. We've talked all day long about, well, all day. probably feels like that. We've talked all this time about how to respond as followers of Jesus. Here's my question. Will we? Just respond. You see, in chapters 1 through 11, I had to take the teaching. I had to take it, and I had to go, okay, based on what was said, here's what we're going to do. You realize I don't have to do that no more? Like for the rest of our time together, I don't have to go, okay, how are we going to respond? Just just do what it says, right? Present your body as a living sacrifice. Give God the keys. And then position yourself to have your mind renewed. Say no to what needs to be said no to. And it needs to be said no to today. You'll wrestle. You'll, you'll, You'll try to rationalize it. And that's part of the problem. I'll do the same thing. Okay, we're all in the same boat. We just gotta say no. No, no more. If God's going to be in control of my life, then that can't be that way anymore. And I can't go there anymore. And those aren't folks that are going to help me. So I can't have that kind of relationship with them anymore. I have a different relationship with them. We'll talk about it later. What do I got to say no to? And then what do I got to say yes to? So, so some, just some sentences to help you respond. Number one, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, here it goes. Ready? confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. If you don't know Jesus today, trust him and him alone. Be in the family. Get in on all that is great that will never be matched. It's the best news you'll ever hear and it's the only life that is eternally with him. Number two, believer. Chances are great we've got sin in our life which is causing us, as we're thinking about presenting our, God, our bodies to God, we're like, well, I, I can't go to him with, with this in my backpack. Yeah, you can. Take the backpack and everything in it and take it to him to present yourself. And as you're presenting yourself, go, and oh, by the way, God, all this, and I know that's not okay. It's sin. I confess it. Will you forgive me of that? Will you lead me away from this so that you can be in control of my life? It's not about getting yourself right before you submit yourself. It's about knowing that submitting yourself involves all the baggage that you got with you. And he's ready to meet you with arms open to bring you in as a child of his. Confess partial surrender. God, I've been trying to walk on both sides of the street and it does not work. I confess that and experience the forgiveness and cleansing that can be yours. Number three, present your body. Like literally present your body to God. To Like literally say to him, God, I'm yours today. I want you to have everything of me. Total commitment. Total surrender. Fresh and new today. And then surrender your mind to the ongoing transformation that comes from God's spirit, God's word, God's people, and just position yourself. You might have to say no to some things that are keeping you from being in the position you need to be. In order to be transformed, that'd be the best no you ever said. Be the best yes you've ever responded to so that you might become and be the very thing that God's called you to be. Now, if we together took that approach, what could God not do for this ragtag bunch of ragamuffins? Bunch of leftovers is what we are. You know how I know that? Because that's what I am. I'm just, I, you know what? Ain't nothing special, nothing polished about me. And everybody said, Amen. okay, I know what we are. And that's all right. Because there ain't a thing God couldn't do through us if we were totally, fully ready, willing, surrendered. Amen? Here's what we're going to do. 
I know it's different. And, and here's the thing. There are no kids anywhere else in the building that have to come to you. We could stay here another hour. They're already with you. And they're probably asleep. And that's great. I know it's different. But I just wonder, we don't do an invitation. I know that. And maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe we ought to do more of that. But here's what I'd like to do. I'm, I'm going to invite you in just a second to bow your head and close your eyes. Not yet. I'm going to invite you in just a second. I'm going to invite, if, if any of our prayer partners are in the building, okay? I know we have prayer partners that stand and, and pray, but if there are any of you that are ever our prayer partners, uh, and, and any of our board members that would like to, I'm going to invite you to come down here and just kind of stand when, when everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And, and if you'd like to come forward and just go, you know what? I need to make a move. I need to get up and I need to move 50 yards in front of me so that I can plant my flag and say, God, I'm giving you my life today. Here are the keys. Man, I don't know what that's going to look like, but I want you to have it. And I want, I, I want to be transformed, be renewed. I want to be faithful. I want to be functional. I want to be useful in your hands. If you want to do that, you'd like to pray with somebody. I'd like for some folks to be here that you can pray with. So when that happens, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. And then I'm going to ask you once folks have come forward and they're praying and y'all can go wherever you need to be, then I'm going to ask you to do so with your head bowed and your eyes closed. I'm going to ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus... <laughs> If you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask you if it is your desire for God to have all of you. No holding back, no turning back. God, I, want, I just want to be, man, I want to be on that altar. I want to live my life for you and your glory. Then I'm going to ask you to stand up right where you are. Nobody's looking around. You're just going to stand up. And then I'm going to give you the cue. And that's going to give you the, the opportunity to just kind of peek. Look around. See where your brothers and sisters are. All right. That's who I'm walking with. Get a bead on somebody and go, okay. All right. I know him. I know her. I'm going to walk with her. If that's not you, that's okay. Don't, don't, don't do something that you don't mean. Okay? Does that make sense? Because I think we ought to respond. Maybe that's silly. I think we ought to respond. So, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're a prayer partner, come on up. If you're a board member and you'd like to come and be a part, you come on up. I just want some folks to be down here to pray with folks. All right? And right where you're at. And, and heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody's looking around. See, these guys are those that I know have to stand up. So, that's why they're down here. I know they have to stand up because they're walking with us. You need, you need prayer this morning? You want to come down here and have somebody pray with you? You want to just get up right now? You need to come down here and just pray at this altar. Is it, will there be something special about just coming down here and putting your knees on this vinyl flooring that's down here? Maybe. If that's you, you want to come down? Anybody want to respond? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody's looking. If you're a follower of Jesus today and you say, God, I, I want you to have all of me. I, I, I don't want to hold nothing back. I want to present my body. I want my foundation to be level. I want to, I want to position myself to have my mind renewed. I, I want to be level at the foundation with you as your child. I want to say, Abba, Father, take the keys to my life and you drive wherever you want me to go. If that's you, I want you to stand up. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody looking around. That's you. I want to hold nothing back. I want to be all in. You are all in for me. I want to be all in for you. Nobody's looking. But you can take a minute. You can peek. You want to peek? If you want to turn around and look, see who you're standing with. All right. Man. What could God not do with a body that has decided no turning back? I'll invite everybody to stay in now. We'll dismiss or we'll, we'll close in prayer. I got a few announcements after that. Listen, if you, you, you were saying, 
Pastor Kevin, I, just don't, I, don't know that, I don't know that I can stand. If it is because you don't feel like you're worthy to stand, oh, man, God's grace is bottomless. God's forgiveness is endless. Oh, you got to trust that he knows you and that he loves you and that you stand in his presence. If you're a follower of his by faith, oh, man, you got to know. And I want to invite you to talk to me about it in the days to come or even at the end of this, end of this time together. God, you know how much I wrestle with staying completely and totally surrendered all the time, all the way. You, you know, you know that, that really, if, if it was who's worthy to stand here and talk about this, you and me both know that I'm not the guy. But I, I just have to believe that you mean what you say. And so on the basis of what you have said, God, I say to you, I, I want to be all yours. I want you to change the way I think. So much still needs to be changed. God, I just ask that you'll take us all. See the ones that have planted their flag. Turn the light on the way forward. We need you desperately. We love you. Without even ability to express how much, teach us how to love you more. Use us this week. Show us the way forward as we move into these next few weeks and as we throw out opportunities and and invite those that are a part of Oasis Church to take a step in service and involvement. I pray that they'll remember today and allow you to tell them in which direction they're to go. As we invite folks to join life groups and, 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 and come under the, 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 the continued study of your word and the surrounding of your people, I pray that you'll remind us that that's what we said we wanted, that you'll lead us into that way for your glory so that we might be faithful and effect, effective servants for you till Jesus comes. Come quickly, but until then, use us. Whatever way you see fit. We love you. We thank you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.